Number 10. Belchite. From 1936 to 1939, Spain was bitterly divided in a violent civil war between nationalist rebels and those loyal to the country's republican government. A small town in the nation's northeastern region, known as Belchite, found itself entangled among the conflict's front lines. In 1937, Belchite was under the control of the nationalist army when the republicans seized it during a weeks-long siege. The battle left the town almost completely destroyed. Author Cecil D. Ebby wrote that the destruction was so extensive that people couldn't even tell where the streets were. Horrified onlookers watched as bodies were pulled from beneath piles of mortar, bricks, and other debris. The stench was unbearable, and the scene was littered with mule carcasses and personal belongings including sewing machines, cooking pots, and other everyday items. Belchite was retaken by the nationalists yet again in 1938 under the command of General Francisco Franco, who later rose to power as a fascist dictator. Instead of razing the town's ruins, he left the site as a monument to the fallen. Residents continued to live there for another 15 years until a new village was built nearby. Today, the eerie yet fascinating ruins look much like they did when they were abandoned. They bear the hallmarks of brutal warfare including bullet-riddled buildings, piles of rubble, and other damage left behind. Number 9. Hacienda del Cochero On the outside, the Hacienda del Cochero in Guanajuato, Mexico is scenic and peaceful. Set against the backdrop of the serene surrounding mountains, the quiet gardens consist of stone paths surrounded by lush vegetation, intricate sculptures, and colorful flowers. Those who dare to venture beyond the entrance to a tunnel leading below ground level will discover something a lot less peaceful. Located beneath the ground is a horrifying torture museum. As visitors wind through its dark, dungeon-like passageways, they'll see various displays filled with disturbing devices like chastity belts, cages, and guillotines. The museum claims that indigenous captives were kept at the site during the forceful mission to convert people to Catholicism, known as the Spanish Inquisition. Prisoners were tortured by the Spaniards in the underground rooms that now house the museum displays until they renounced their religious views and converted to Christianity. The subterranean chambers also functioned as holding cells for people who were accused of breaking even trivial laws. Number 8. The Land of Black Magic Located in northeastern India, the isolated, centuries-old village of Mayang has been passing down its legacy of witchcraft and wizardry for many generations. Legend holds that people in Mayang have transformed into animals and that men have disappeared just by uttering the words Luki Mantra. There's also an ancient tale claiming that during the village's early days, saying Uran Mantra would enable someone to fly through the air and land beside their true love. Mayang was supposedly founded when black magic practitioners sheltered in the woods. They were accused of using witchcraft to kill Muhammad Shah's army of 100,000 horsemen in 1337. It's also rumored that swords resembling the weapons that were used to perform human sacrifices during ancient times have been found buried in the village. Today, Mayong retains its eerie vibes. Locals offer palm readings and fortune-telling sessions to the occasional traveler who passes through. There are still witch doctors and spiritual healers living there who offer their services with helping people find the answers they're looking for in their lives. The one thing their spells can't do is change the weather. Number 7. Via de Vecchi In the village of Archangelos on the Greek island of Rhodes, there's a two-story home made of stone and wood that was intended to serve as dictator Benito Mussolini's summer home. He never made it to Via de Vecchi. His advisor, Count Cesare de Vecchi, ended up living there instead while governing the Dodecanese Islands, which Italy had seized from the Ottoman Empire in 1912. The islands were ceded to Greece in 1947 and Vecchi abandoned his villa after living in it for 11 years. Since then it's remained completely deserted and it's fallen further into decay over the years at the hands of time, nature, and vandals who have covered the interior with graffiti. Some believe that the government let the mansion fall apart on purpose as a reminder of De Vecchi's cruel ways and the Dodecanese people's refusal to become Italianized. Via De Vecchi was listed for sale in 2014. It's unclear whether it sold, but it remains infamous to this day as one of Italy's most haunted houses. At the time it was put on the market, it was one of many properties that Greece was selling in an effort to repay loans it borrowed from the International Monetary Fund IMF, and the European Central Bank ECB. Speaking to Bloomberg, Hellenic Republic Assets Development Fund HRADF Executive Director Andreas Taprancis described Villa De Vecchi and other properties as long hidden and buried. He saw their sale as an opportunity to showcase forgotten historical and cultural sites to both Greeks and tourists. But it seems as though Villa de Vecchi is a place many people would rather forget. Number 6. Boca do Inferno 
In English, Boca do Inferno means mouth of hell. It's the name of a scenic cliff formation and cave opening in the coastal town of Cascais, Portugal. The site is named after the way the Atlantic waves splash forcefully into the cave system. But its ominous name and the rough waters that crash into it are the least disturbing things about it. Boca do Inferno is infamously known as the place where magician and occultist Aleister Crowley faked his death in 1930. He commissioned the help of a poet named Fernando Pessoa, who passed his phony suicide note on to the press. The letter consisted of an array of symbols mixed with messy Portuguese which Pessoa helped translate for the confused media. It supposedly said, Can't live without you. The other mouth of hell that will catch me won't be as hot as yours. Three weeks later, Crowley reappeared alive and well in Berlin at a gallery opening. In the end, he had only pretended to take his life, presumably as some type of twisted PR stunt. There's a plaque at the Boca do Inferno marking it as the place Crowley staged his death. Have you ever heard of Aleister Crowley? Tell us in the comments and hit subscribe while you're at it. Number 5. Grasshopper Chapel Throughout the 19th century, the Midwest was occasionally plagued by Rocky Mountain locusts. During a particularly bad infestation in 1873 that sparked four consecutive years of locust plagues, the insects devoured crops, wood, fruit, and clothing. The locust swarms grew so large and powerful that locals were helpless to combat them. After a statewide day of prayer in Minnesota failed to resolve the problem in 1877, a priest in Stearns County named Father Leo Winter suggested petitioning the Virgin Mary for help. Parishioners set to work on a quaint hilltop chapel overlooking the city of Cold Spring. In the meantime, the locusts vanished. They were completely gone by the time the church was finished being built, and they didn't stick around long enough to lay eggs, so they didn't return the following year. Less than three decades later, the species went extinct. The original chapel was destroyed by a tornado in 1894, and a new one was built in 1952. It contains an altar, four stained glass windows, and a Virgin Mary statue that was removed from the first chapel. A relief of the Virgin with two grasshoppers marks the small church's entryway. Number 4. Kayakoi Situated among Turkey's Taurus Mountains near the Mediterranean coastline, there's a village filled with neglected streets and decaying buildings. It only takes a few seconds of looking around to realize that nobody lives there. Originally called Carmelasos, the 18th century town was originally home to a Greek Orthodox population which grew to include as many as 20,000 residents by the early 20th century. From 1919 to 1922, the Greeks and Turks fought over land in what later became known as the Greco-Turkish War. Violence was often aimed at the Greek Orthodox communities in Turkish territory. People fled in droves, while a few stubborn and brave souls remained committed to staying. In the meantime, Turkish Muslims in Greece bore the brunt of the country's rivalry. In an effort to curb the bloodshed, the Greek and Turkish government started a population exchange in 1923. This meant that even though the residents of Kayakoi had been lucky enough to continue living peacefully among their Turkish neighbors, they had no choice but to leave and return to Greece. A refugee crisis ensued in both countries as authorities scrambled to arrange housing for the sudden influx of migrants. Kayakoi's 350 houses remained vacant. Resettled Turkish Muslims didn't want to live there because of the stories of death they had heard. Time has taken an immense toll on Kayakoi's buildings, which look much more ancient than they are and have an eerie beauty to them. They remain standing as a historical monument and a reminder of the forced relocation that upended hundreds of thousands of people's lives. Number 3. Chateau Miranda Located in Belgium, the 19th century neo-Gothic castle Chateau Miranda was built starting in 1866. It was commissioned by the Leida Kirk de Beaufort family, who had left their previous castle during the French Revolution nearly 70 years earlier. The massive home had over 100 rooms and construction took a long time. So long, in fact, that it was still being built when its designer, English architect Edward Milner, died in 1884. Chateau Miranda was finally finished in 1907 when its clock tower was erected. The original owner's descendants lived in the house until World War II when it was taken over by the Nazis during the Battle of the Bulge. In 1950, the National Railway Company of Belgium took ownership of the castle and renamed it Chateau de Noisy. It functioned as an orphanage and a holiday camp for sickly children until the late 1970s. The site became too costly to maintain and was abandoned in 1991. That same year, a huge fire majorly destroyed parts of the castle. At the time, Chateau Miranda was still under the guardianship of the Leiderkirk de Beaufort family, who refused to let the municipal government take over the property. Nobody else wanted to invest in it, and it soon became derelict. The ceilings collapsed, and vandals hastened the castle's decay. It remained popular among urban explorers, but became a major safety concern. With its structural integrity severely compromised by all the damage it had incurred over the years, Chateau Miranda was beyond saving. 
Demolition began in 2016, and it took about a year for the castle to come down entirely. Photographer Matthew Hampshire had the opportunity to snap some of the last known photos of the sprawling structure before it was razed to the ground. He memorialized the crumbling castle during its final moments, ensuring that it won't be forgotten, even though it no longer exists. Number 2. Lake Reschen Bell Tower Nestled among the Italian Alps near the Austrian and Swiss borders, Lake Reschen is a man-made reservoir with a 14th-century steeple jutting out from the surface. Located in the province of South Tyrol, it's the only remaining visible remnant of the village that once stood in the valley before it was filled with water. Plans to create a reservoir for a hydroelectric plant date back to 1920, but originally called for a much smaller and more shallow body of water. That changed in 1939 when the chemical company Montecatini proposed connecting two natural bodies of water, which would require creating a much bigger lake than initially planned. Several villages would inevitably be flooded as part of the process. The project was repeatedly delayed due to World War II and resistance from locals, who fought to save their villages from being submerged. But they ultimately lost that battle, and in 1950, water began to flow into Vinchgau Valley, drowning 163 homes and 1,290 acres of cultivated land. Before creating the lake, workers demolished the nave of the Church of St. Katharina and removed the bells from its steeple. Established in 1357, the historic house of worship once stood as a testament to the area's long and rich history. But the bell tower was left in place and still stands today as all that's left of the village. It's become somewhat of a tourist attraction, and authorities have even started to occasionally drain the lake to perform maintenance on the steeple and make sure it still stands. Even though there are no longer any bells in the tower, local legend claims that you can sometimes hear them ringing during the winter. Number 1. Chateau de Taureau Located in the Bay of Morlaix at the southern entrance to the English Channel is the Chateau de Taureau. It was built starting in the 16th century as a fort to defend the bay from the English. Its construction followed the plunder of Morlaix in 1522 when English soldiers stormed the city disguised as merchants. Equipped with powerful cannons and surrounded by a 21-foot thick wall, Chateau de Taureau gave the French a major advantage over any enemies that might enter the bay. In 1720, the fortress was converted into a prison. During the 19th century, French socialist and political activist Louis-Auguste Blanqui was relegated to the castle. In the 1930s, it became the home of a renowned journalist, novelist, and the widow of a wealthy seed merchant named Mélanie Lévesque de Villemorin. From 1960 to 1980, Château de Taureau operated as a sailing school. Today, the castle has been restored and is open to the public for tours and as a vacation property, but is not accessible by foot. Number 3. Republic F-84 Thunderjet the Republic F-84 Thunderjet was a turbojet fighter-bomber aircraft that was developed at the end of World War II. It was designed in response to the U.S. Army Air Force's USAAF desire to develop a day fighter. Their proposal called for a jet-powered fighter aircraft with a top speed of 600 miles per hour, a combat radius of 850 miles, and an armament of six to eight machine guns. The Thunderjet's designers initially tried to replace the P-47 Thunderbolt's piston-powered engine with a jet engine, but soon realized that the Thunderbolt's fuselage couldn't easily be redesigned to accommodate the new engines. So they built an entirely new aircraft with a slimmer fuselage and other features that marked the U.S. military's transition into the era of modern aviation. The specifications set forth by Chief Designer Alexander Cartvelli proved to be too ambitious. Consequently, the Thunderjet's range was reduced to 705 miles, and its armament requirement was decreased to four to six machine guns. The military counted on the aircraft to be a success even before it took to the skies for the first time. Problems began to emerge during wind tunnel testing of the prototype in 1945, which revealed longitudinal instability, meaning that the plane had a tendency to pitch up or down, and it struggled to maintain a consistent altitude. It was also prone to skin buckling on the stabilizer at high speeds. Adding to the growing list of concerns about the Thunderjet was the fact that it seemed to keep getting heavier and heavier, prompting USAAF officials to impose a gross weight limit of 13,400 pounds. Despite any red flags, development continued, and in 1946 the aircraft set a national speed record of 607.2 miles per hour. Prototypes only underwent limited testing before Thunderjets were rolling off the production line. It wasn't long before the lack of thoroughness caught up with the military. The thick wings had weak spars and the plane's wingtip fuel tanks were shaky. Right as the Pentagon was about to cancel the program for the aircraft's failure to fulfill its intended purpose, the Republic debuted an updated version of the Thunderjet. Known as the F-84D, it had a more powerful engine, sturdier wing spars, and improved fuel tanks. But the plane was still far from perfect. Due to its weight, it had high takeoff and landing speeds, requiring a longer runway than previous aircraft models of its type. 
Its wing design also made it slower than competing fighter jets like the Soviet-built MiG-15, which reached speeds of up to 680 miles per hour. The F-84D was replaced by yet another improved version of itself called the F-84E, which was dispatched to serve under the U.S. 5th Air Force in the Korean War in 1950. It quickly became clear that the Thunder Jet was inferior to the MiG-15, forcing military commanders to use it for ground attacks rather than air-to-air -air combat. It nevertheless came to play a major role in the conflict, flying more than 86,000 missions and dropping nearly 55,600 tons of bombs and 6,129 tons of napalm over North Korea. According to the Air Force, the Thunder Jet was responsible for taking out an estimated 60% of all ground targets that the Americans destroyed. One of the F-84's biggest contributions to the war came in late June 1952, when 84 Thunder Jets laid siege to the Sui Ho Dam complex, destroying 90% of its hydroelectric generating facilities and leaving North Korea without power for two weeks. While the raid failed to achieve its objective of pressuring the North Koreans into peace negotiations, the F-84s accomplished what they set out to do. In addition to its impressive combat performance, the Thunder Jet was the first fighter to use aerial refueling, which is when one aircraft delivers fuel to another while flying. The Republic continued to develop the F-84 series throughout the 1950s. The F-84G was the final model in the F-84 series to be designed and built. By the time the later models entered service, technology was advancing rapidly and the Thunder Jet and its successors were quickly becoming obsolete. During the late 1950s, the Air Force began to retire all the F-84 models in favor of more advanced supersonic fighter jets. The aircraft continued to serve in the National Guard until 1970 and has served in 14 countries besides the U.S., including Belgium, Denmark, France, Norway, Italy, Turkey, Portugal, and China. The Greek Air Force retired the last F-84 in 1991. If you had the chance to fly in an F-84 Thunder Jet, would you do it? Tell us in the comments below and hit subscribe while you're at it. Number 2. FV-101 Scorpion The FV-101 Scorpion is a light tank and a tracked armored reconnaissance vehicle that was developed during the early 1960s. It entered into service with the British Army in 1973 and was retired over 20 years later in 1994. During that time, more than 3,000 were produced for the British Army, the Royal Air Force Regiment, and as exports. As a light reconnaissance tank, the Scorpion is part of a family of armored fighting vehicles called the Combat Vehicle Reconnaissance Tract, or CVRT, which also includes armored personnel carriers, armored ambulances, anti-tank guided missile vehicles, and armored recovery vehicles. Designed to share common parts, all CVRT variants were meant to be small, light, and highly mobile with low ground pressure. Unlike conventional tanks, the Scorpion was designed to be transportable by air which meant that it couldn't be built with typical armor, which would have been too heavy. Instead of steel, its designers opted for an aluminum alloy armor, which kept its weight to around 8.8 .8 tons. In order to fit inside the transport aircraft of the time, the Scorpion could be no more than 8 feet 2 inches long and no wider than 6 feet 10.8 inches. This left limited room for the engine, which had to fit next to a driver in full winter gear and therefore had a maximum width of 24 inches. Because no tank engines were suitable for the vehicle, its designers used a six-cylinder Jaguar 4.2-liter gas engine that was modified to use military-grade fuel and then replaced with a diesel engine. The Scorpion prototypes went through extensive hot and cold weather testing in some of the world's most extreme environments, including parts of Norway, Canada, Australia, and Abu Dhabi. It performed well in all settings, especially when it came to speed. The vehicle was capable of accelerating from standing to 30 miles per hour in 16 seconds and had a top speed of around 50 miles per hour. Various sources claim that it achieved the Guinness World Record for the fastest production tank after reaching a speed of 51.1 miles per hour at the Chinti Q vehicle test track in Surrey, England in 2002. While it's unclear whether it still officially holds the record, the FV-101 is definitely known to be faster than any other vehicle of its kind. While it had the advantage of speed and versatility, the Scorpion sacrificed when it came to other aspects of the vehicle. There were limits on what its lightweight armor could withstand, but it was capable of resisting a decent amount of gunfire. It was prone to corrosion and stress fractures, however, and all early versions of the Scorpion were heavily affected by the issue. It nevertheless became incredibly popular throughout the world during its operating years. Militaries in more than a dozen countries have used the Scorpion, including Belgium, Brunei, Chile, Honduras, Indonesia, Ireland, Jordan, Malaysia, New Zealand, Nigeria, the Philippines, Spain, Tanzania, Thailand, Venezuela, and more. The vehicle served in numerous major military operations, including during the Turkish invasion of Cyprus in 1974, the year after it began rolling off the production line. Later that year, the British government decided to permanently withdraw its forces from the bitterly divided country. Scorpions also served during the Falklands War, a 10-week conflict between the UK and Argentina that took place in 1982. 
as well as the Iran-Iraq War, which lasted from 1980 to 1988, and the Gulf War, which occurred over a six-month period between 1990 and 1991. The British military retired the vehicles just a few years later, mainly because firing the main armament caused toxicity hazards inside the crew compartment. They were also withdrawn because the military favored other CBRT vehicles, namely the Scimitar and Spartan, and no longer needed the Scorpion to carry out their duties. Some countries still use the Scorpion today, including the Botswana Defense Force, the Iranian Army, and the Nigerian Army. Malaysia used them until 2018 when officials announced that the vehicle no longer served the country's military needs and that it had become inconvenient and expensive to maintain. The British military is working to develop new vehicles to replace the Scimitar and Spartan that are still being used, and the era of the CVRT vehicle will most likely come to an end sometime over the next several years. Number 1. Iowa-class battleships Built for the U.S. Navy during the 1940s, Iowa-class battleships were designed to intercept the fastest warships of enemy navies and to act as the fast wing in traditional battle lines alongside slower battleships. Four vessels were completed, the USS Iowa, New Jersey, Missouri, and Wisconsin. They were conceptualized as part of the Navy's War Plan Orange, which anticipated eventual warfare with Japan in the Pacific arena. Military experts predicted that U.S. forces would be vulnerable to high-speed Japanese cruisers and that the existing American battleships would be too slow to force Japanese vessels into battle. Navy planners envisioned a fast attachment that could keep up with its aircraft carriers and a strike force that could act as scouts by operating ahead of the rest of their fleet and which could also fight alongside their fleet when necessary. This was the first time that the Navy prioritized speed in a battleship design. The North Carolina and South Dakota class ships that preceded the Iowa class vessels were heavily armed but slow with a maximum speed of around 32 miles per hour or 28 knots. Their designers were limited by the terms of the Washington Naval Treaty, which imposed a maximum standard tonnage of 35,000 tons for each vessel. Signed after World War I, the treaty was an agreement among various countries to restrict their naval construction for the sake of preventing an arms race. When Japan withdrew from disarmament discussions in 1936, an updated treaty increased the maximum standard tonnage of the participating party's naval ships to 45,000 tons. U.S. naval architects had the advantage of working within these widened parameters when they designed the Iowa-class vessels, resulting in the fastest battleships ever built. Each ship measured 880 feet long and was powered by eight boilers and four propellers. Rumors claimed that they were capable of reaching speeds of up to 40 miles per hour over short distances, but its officially recorded top speed was 35.7 miles per hour, or 31 knots. The Iowa-class ships served in five wars between the 1940s and the early 1990s. During World War II, they functioned as fast escorts for Essex-class aircraft carriers. They provided naval gunfire support to United Nations forces during the Korean War before being decommissioned and mothballed during the late 1950s. In 1968, during the Vietnam War, the USS New Jersey came out of retirement to serve in the Vietnam War. Before being sent overseas, the ship underwent a modernization overhaul. After having its radar upgraded and receiving improved electronic warfare systems along with other improvements, the crew performed a shakedown cruise to test its performance. During the cruise, Captain Floyd Gooch pushed the engines to their limits, reaching a top speed of 40 miles per hour or 35 knots. The ship held this speed for six hours until Captain Gooch decided to see if its engineering plant could handle maximum strain. He ordered the ship to go instantly from all ahead flank, which means to drive at the maximum speed, to all back emergency, which means the opposite. The New Jersey continued moving for two miles before finally coming to a full stop. A post-shakedown inspection of the ship found the engine in perfect working order even after being brutally tested. In 1969, the USS New Jersey appeared on a list of ships that the government had ordered to be inactivated. It was towed to the Puget Sound Naval Shipyard for storage, and it was unclear whether the aging Iowa-class ships would ever re-enter service. During the 1980s, the vessels were reactivated and armed with missiles as part of the 600-ship Navy initiative, which sought to rebuild the Navy's fleet following post-Vietnam cutbacks. Their last combat engagement came during the Gulf War in 1991, when the USS Wisconsin and Missouri fired missiles at Iraqi targets. Following the collapse of the Soviet Union, the U.S. scaled back on the fleet that was created under the 600-ship Navy plan. By then, the Iowa-class ships had become more or less obsolete anyway, but they had come to represent a source of national pride, so they were spared from being scrapped and donated to various museums around the country where they remain to this day. There's a 500-mile stretch of barren coastline in Namibia that's famous for its unforgiving conditions. This environment has left the shoreline littered with hundreds of decaying shipwrecks. This place is known as the Skeleton Coast, and it's also filled with the remains of animals who lost their battle against the elements. This serves as yet another reminder that death is ever-present. 
Over the centuries, more than 500 vessels have run aground or capsized in thick fog, rough seas, unpredictable currents, and heavy winds. Sailors who survived the wreck and managed to reach dry land often died of thirst in the scorching desert heat before they could reach safety. One of the most famous wrecks along the skeleton coast is the Edward Bolum. This was a 310-foot-long cargo ship that became trapped in fog and ran aground in 1909. As the desert encroached upon the shoreline over the following years, the vessel became partially buried in sand. Today, it sits over 1,000 feet away from the water, near two other wrecks, the Atavi and the MV Dunedin Star. The MV Dunedin Star was a cargo ship that wrecked in 1942, and the Atavi, interestingly, exploded and then sank in 1945. The most fascinating wreck discovery along the Skeleton Coast came in 2008. A group of diamond miners and geologists drained a man-made salt lake on a section of the coast known as the Forbidden Area. A worker spotted a copper ingot that had a trident-shaped marking on it, and the crew proceeded to notice pieces of wood and metal scattered throughout the worksite. They soon realized that it was a very old buried ship and immediately suspended mining operations at the site so archaeologists could excavate. Experts identified the wreck as the Bom Jesus, a Portuguese vessel that vanished along with its crew in 1533. It had apparently been sailing from Lisbon to India with roughly 300 sailors, soldiers, merchants, priests, nobles, and enslaved individuals on board. The ship set sail on March 7th as part of a fleet for a 15th-month round trip with plans to make several stops along the way and return with pepper and other spices from the Far East. However, it disappeared roughly four months into its journey during a rough storm off the southwest African coast. None of the individuals traveling aboard the vessel ever reached their destinations or made it back home. While written evidence is extremely limited, documents from the period list the Bom Jesus as the only Portuguese ship that went missing anywhere near the Namibian coast. This makes it extremely unlikely for the wreck to be any other vessel. According to historical records, the Bom Jesus was lost near the Cape of Good Hope, which is located south of Namibia along the South African coast. The events leading up to the ship's loss are unclear. Records indicate that a storm broke up the fleet that the Bom Jesus was sailing with before winds and currents drove it several hundred miles north. This eventually caused it to slam into a rocky outcrop along the skeleton coast. Archaeologist Dieter Tanoli told National Geographic that winter storms are especially nasty in the region. He said that the conditions could have involved 80 mile per hour winds and a huge breaking surf. He also mentioned that it would have been impossible for the ship to reach the shore and that even on a calm day, the blinding fog could have easily played a role in the disaster. At nearly 500 years old, the Bom Hesels is the oldest wreck ever found in southern Africa. It's also the only treasure-laden wreck ever discovered in the region, containing more than 2,000 gold coins, at least 22 tons of copper ingots, and over 100 elephant tusks. The coins consisted mostly of Spanish excellentes featuring King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella, who ruled Spain during the late 15th and early 16th centuries. The hoard also contained Venetian, Moorish, French, and Portuguese coins featuring King Yao III. These extremely rare pieces were only issued from 1525 to 1538 and played a vital role in identifying the Bom Jesus. After they were recalled, the monarchy melted down all the coins that they were able to recover, narrowing the date of the voyage to a 13-year period. The copper ingots found among the wreck indicated that the ship was on its way to India to buy spices, further increasing the chances of it being the Bom Jesus. Another clue to the ship's identity came in the form of a royal letter written about a month before the ship set sail. It describes how King Zhao had recently sent a knight to Seville to pick up gold from businessmen who'd invested in the fleet. This helps to explain why the Bom Hesels had an unusually large amount of Spanish gold aboard despite being a Portuguese vessel. In addition to the treasure, Archaeologists found navigation equipment and personal possessions, including swords, muskets, chainmail, dinner plates, cutlery, and trinket boxes. The only human remains found among the wreck include some toe bones inside a shoe, indicating that while at least one person died on the ship, many or most of the people on board likely made it to land. At that time of year, the weather would have been cold. Anyone who survived the initial wreck would have found themselves stranded in a remote place where nobody was looking for them. 
Nolly said that the group could have survived if they were resourceful enough and sought help from local hunter-gatherer populations. While their fate is unclear, none of them ever made it home, indicating that they likely perished at some point during their quest to stay alive. Prominent Portuguese archaeologist Francisco Alves told National Geographic that the discovery of the wreck itself was valuable. It's extremely rare to find such old ships of its kind, and the Bob Hezels gave experts an opportunity to learn more about these vessels. It's even more rare to discover a centuries-old wreck left untouched by treasure hunters, making the discovery unprecedented, and its contents are teaching researchers a lot of new information about past trade. A mitochondrial DNA and isotope analysis traced the ivory to the forest elephant, a species native to the humid forests of West Africa and the Congo Basin. In fact, scientists identified 17 distinct lineages and could only link four of them to modern-day herds. Until recently, they believed that forest elephants left their native habitat for a drier environment as recently as the early 20th century, most likely due to hunters driving them out of their native environment. But some scientists believe that the 500-year-old tusks found on the bomb hezels came from elephants that were killed near the coast, indicating that the species may have left the rainforest as early as the 16th century. Different elephant species generally stick to specific regions and habitats. But the discovery puts the animals in a mixed environment and shows that they may have chosen to relocate long before they were nearly driven to extinction. While the animals' reasons for migrating are unclear, the possibility suggests that they may have already been affected by human activity on a deeper level than previously thought. The problem's roots may date further back than anyone realized, but the exact dynamics remain unknown. Speaking with Science News, archaeologist Paul Lane explained that the variety of lineages in the findings indicates that the elephants may have been killed in West Africa by various communities who supplied the tusks to trading ports along the continent's east coast. In other words, perhaps they didn't stray too far from their natural habitat after all. It's also unclear whether the ship acquired the tusks from multiple small ports along the coast or a large trading port. For conservationists who are trying to save today's forest elephants from extinction, this information is significantly more important than the monetary value of any treasures found on the bomb Jesus. Forest elephants, who are smaller than savannah elephants, remain under the constant threat of ivory poachers. According to the African Wildlife Foundation, they currently occupy just a quarter of their historic range, after having roughly 60% of their population killed off over the last decade. Learning more about the species' past movement and the movements of ivory can help researchers better address modern-day concerns revolving around the illegal market. Experts predict that it'll take years for them to fully examine the bomb Hesels and the thousands of artifacts that were found with it. Speaking with National Geographic, nautical archaeologist Felipe Vieira de Castro described the ship's discovery as a game-changer that will offer insight into the period's shipbuilding techniques as well as what life at sea was like. They hope to understand things like how meals were prepared and what types of items people chose to bring with them. Records have revealed that Portuguese sailing vessels were some of the grandest, most advanced ships of the time. It was precisely this technology that enabled the Portuguese to sail to far-flung places that had only recently become accessible. These ships were also well-decorated, and when the bomb Hesel set sail, it was draped with vivid silks and velvets, along with raised flags that billowed proudly in the wind. Owned by King Hal III, the sturdy, well-built ship was brand new when it departed for its ill-fated journey. But there's still a lot researchers don't know about Portuguese trading vessels, according to Castro. In addition to the lack of examples to learn from, a catastrophic earthquake, tsunami, and fire destroyed the building housing the vast majority of Lisbon's maritime documents in 1755. Maps, charts, and shipping records were all sent tumbling into the Targos River after the building caught fire and collapsed and were lost to history. Not only is it rare to discover an intact shipwreck, locating historical documentation about Portuguese ships and commerce is like finding a needle in a haystack. This makes the search for information extremely difficult and complicated. The bomb Jesus may not have evaded plunder if it weren't for the presence of the heavily guarded De Beers diamond mine, which has been operating since the early 20th century. After the first diamond was discovered in 1908, 
a 10,000 square mile section of the Skeleton Coast was closed to the public. No bodies allowed there without the permission of De Beers, hence the property's nickname, the Forbidden Area. The off-limit zone consists of 200 miles of coastline, meaning there could be more buried wrecks waiting to be discovered. Archaeologists also had the copper ingots found on the bomb Hezos to thank for the wreck remaining intact. If not for their weight keeping everything in place, precious artifacts would have been washed away by storms and waves, according to Bruno Vers, who's the director of the Southern African Institute of Maritime Archaeology. The ingots also helped to preserve the elephant tusks by pushing them down into the seabed, where they were protected from the unforgiving ocean. Time and nature still took a heavy toll on the wreck, which was found scattered over a several-mile area. Its contents are the only reason it didn't disappear completely. Sailing technology has come a long way since the bomb Hezos, yet ships and boats continue to wreck along the skeleton coast. It seems that man-made machines are often no match against the brutal forces of nature there. One of the most notable modern disasters to make headlines happened in 2013, after a South African sailing enthusiast named Mike Kuhn sold all his worldly possessions, quit his job, and set sail for the Caribbean. His ship was a 43-foot yacht called the Miski. Kuhn left England with a crew who spent a month teaching him the ins and outs of sailing. He then continued along the voyage alone, with plans to meet up with his girlfriend at his final destination. The weather forecast predicted four days of somewhat difficult conditions, but the crew reassured Kuhn that he could handle the journey on his own. It looked like the weather would stay nice for a while after the impending storm passed. By his third day into the voyage, Kuhn was encountering swells of up to 13 feet as he struggled to lower the sails. He tried to wait out the storm, but eventually started to panic and called for help. A tanker called the Aqua Fortune diverted from its route to rescue Kuhn, but struggled to get close enough to help him. He tried to grab a rope that the crew threw down from the ship, but ended up stranded in the water for an hour and a half while the Aqua Fortune turned around and came back to search for him. This time, he held onto the rope for dear life and made it onto the ship. By then, he'd gone two days without sleep, and he collapsed from exhaustion the moment his feet hit the deck. Kuhn abandoned the yacht and returned to South Africa in his wetsuit with just a few dollars to his name. In the meantime, the Miski drifted until it appeared on the shore of False Cape Freer, which is located along the Skeleton Coast. It took some searching, but those that discovered the ship were eventually able to track Kuhn down to let him know they had located his boat. After enduring such a traumatic ordeal and losing everything he owned, Kuhn had decided that he was done with sailing. He told the authorities to collect any valuables they found on board. However, he was not interested in retrieving the yacht, which joined the ever-growing collection of wrecks in the region. Unlike the bomb Hezos, there was nothing valuable left on the Miski. Anything the authorities did find wasn't worth traveling to Namibia to retrieve, especially considering the tight budget Kuhn was on following the disaster. In 2014, the Ministry of Fisheries and Marine Resources clarified that it would decide what to do with the wreck. Although, it's unclear whether a decision was made or if it's still sitting at its resting spot along the skeleton coast. Thanks for watching. Would you rather survive a shipwreck and make millions off an autobiography or discover a shipwreck full of riches? Let us know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up, and while you're at it, don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you next time. Bye.